What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Couch Show Review. We're going to recap uh, round 29 in action. We're going to talk about the Azzurri, get ready for the Euro Tournament, all the latest news in Serie A, and then, of course, preview and predictions for round 29. And I'm joined with Lou yet again. How are you doing, my man? Good. How about you? Happy to be um, here. Oh, yeah. I'm doing good, man. Doing good. But uh, other than some of the news we had to deal with as you've been today, we'll get to that. And then... Uh, we welcome for the first time on the Couch Review. This guy's rattled enough cages on Twitter to uh, get himself on uh, the Couch Review and uh, actually had a funny one uh, with uh, Calafiore, one of Juve's targets. But uh, Gianni from Interviews Pod, how are you doing, my man? And welcome to the show. Doing great, man. No, I appreciate finally uh, finally making the cut. I figured I had to <laughs> do enough trolling to, to earn a spot here. So super happy to, to finally make it. <laughs> Hey, man, you know, we always say pick something, be the best at it, and trolling might be it for you. Uh, you're uh, rattling cages and doing a good job, but uh, fun account to follow, uh, despite the uh, club allegiance, which uh, obviously is, uh, you know, where the banter uh, stems from, but it's all good. For a couple weeks, we were all kind of united, uh, maybe going at the Azzurri more than supporting, but the Azzurri made their way to USA in the first time in, like, I think... 21 years something in that range it's been a long time and um yeah a lot of uh, a couple of the guys from uh, the ajc lou made their way down in uh, joe cappuccino a bunch of the uh fan club groups around that area and we saw a couple friendlies we saw one against venezuela one against ecuador real quick we're gonna get your guys thoughts on uh, those friendlies and then kind of talk about this roster that we'll most likely see at the Euros and what we think is going to happen on those Euros. So uh, we'll start with the featured guest Gianni there. What were your thoughts on the Azzurri's uh, friendlies there? I mean, glad we were able to get two wins out of both matches. I think that was crucial, especially going up against teams of that caliber. You know, you look at what Venezuela and Ecuador have, it's not really anything that we should be uh, struggling to go with, go up against, especially the depth of our squad. Um, but I just felt like there was a serious lack of cohesiveness. You know, like they just, guys just didn't seem comfortable with each other. I get it. Spalletti's trying different things. He did a few different formations and, and gave guys uh, runouts and positions that they're probably not too familiar with. But I was hoping to see a little bit more bite and attack, and it just felt like it was kind of lacking there. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Lou, your uh, thoughts on the friendlies? Yeah, I, I thought the, the second one was much better than the uh, first one. The second one was Venice, Ecuador, right? Was the yeah. second one? Yeah. Yeah, that one was, I think, was a better performance. Not anything to blow your hat off, but in terms of just, you know, performance, the second one was definitely an easier win than the first one. I also think the second lineup was probably a little bit better than the first one was, which yeah. might be part of that reason. Uh, I respect Spalletti for trying something new. The 3 uh, four, two, one was definitely something we hadn't seen before. I... I don't know how it worked. I really was disappointed that Cherby, and we'll talk about why he wasn't there later, wasn't there because I wanted to see like a full blown like starting 11, like, hey, this could be our best XI, like going into a friendly. How does it work in this formation? I feel like we were robbed uh, a little bit um, in that second game. I just, with the Azuri, the hard part with this job is that Spalletti got this job so late. And he has a lot of like new guys, a lot of guys that you know haven't capped a lot or have, but like haven't had more prominent roles. A couple leftover younger guys from the Euros now going to leadership roles, but you know, Donnarumma, Chiesa, Locatelli, you know, Jorginho's kind of on the outside, some more places, like not really the greatest club form. So it's like you have to rely on those guys, but then you also have these young guys who really haven't done much for the Azuri um, come through. So I feel for Spalletti a little bit because he's trying a lot and we're looking for cohesion, but just I feel like they just they need that two year grace period before the Euro to get it. Unfortunately, they just don't have it. Um, if I was going to be positive though, Rotegi looks like he's the number nine for us right now. I, I thought that's the big positive for the first game for me. He scored two great goals. Um, Donnarumma had a howler, but came back and saved a good penalty, so that's great too. Um, but yeah, I just. I just wish this team had more time to kind of like build something, right? To really try and tinker something. And I, I feel for Spalletti a little bit because he's trying. And I respect that he keeps, you know, changing who he's calling up and the formation as much as he can. But it's just a hard job. 
Yeah, well, we got to talk about it because he is trying something different and he went with that 3 4 2 1 setup and whatnot. And I do agree that the personnel made a big, big difference um, in the second friendly uh, from the first. And the first could have been some jet lag involved too. It's a big difference uh, when you're jumping over there the six hours uh, to the east coast of uh, North America versus uh, European time, right? But uh, defensively, it was concerning watching that setup. There was space everywhere, and when no disrespect to you know Ecuador and Venezuela, but when they're carving you up like that, it makes you wonder if that's a setup you need to be going when you're going to be facing some tough competition and going into a, a Euros tournament. So I think that for me is the biggest question mark about continuing on with that because they're not going to have a lot of time. I think they have two more games before the actual yeah. tournament, yeah. right? And for me, that's kind of concerning. I feel like I completely agree that Deggy's the guy I'm going to go with and lock in. It's five games. It's been four goals. Nobody else has produced like that for the Azzurri in quite some time like up there. So just roll with that. Outside of that, I think the midfield has to have three guys in there for stability. Um, and that's why this 3 4 2 one, just the spacing defensively it wasn't working and he, i don't know if he can continue with it i understand why he'd want to lean towards that because the spine of this team is going to come from inter and that's kind of the close to what they play a 3-5-2 um he's doing it 3-4-2-1 but i can understand that i just don't know how confident i am in it with only a couple more games to go and then that tournament guys Stick with the three four two one, or maybe get out of it. It's a tough call too when you look at the back line, yeah. right? I wanted to. This is the other thing with like only having two games, right? Because I thought that in the second game, Pellegrini in that role where it's like the the third attacking player was basically a midfielder, right? That was jumping between the two, and Pellegrini occupied that role really well. I actually think Barella could probably do that role really good if he played with a double pivot, you know, because he has that capability to get in the box, score goals, but can also drop back and you know win the ball back. So I like that idea, um, and I really think that probably the strong suit in terms of creativity is DeMarco and Cambiasso. But you're right; like when we defend, there's large gaps on the counterattack uh, between you know the midfield, even the wing backs and the center backs, and that's where I get worried because as good as the inter back line has been, you know Darmian, Acherbi, and Bastoni, it's a little bit different from the Azuri because it's not Inter's like full team, right? It's not their setup. It's it, yeah. it's set up with something just a little bit different and you think about teaming at like spain they'll have a lot of the ball we're not really going to be able to counter to or we're not going to really be able to attack them like that but then you wonder too if they defend this team is kind of limited in attack like how much do you lose doing that that's kind of like the hard you know tug of war we play here if there was a gun the to your head lou would you change the setup or would you keep riding the three four two one out I would keep the the back three. I think it would just have to be more of like a three five two than a three four mm. one two. And uh, yeah. Gianni, what do you think? Ride it out with a three four two one. Switch to three five two or go four three three. I would actually go four three three. And although I'm an interista, I'm not the the most confident of the inter back three as a back three for the national team. And the reason I say that is because I don't think, well, that's not that I don't think, Darmian and Acerbi aren't the, like the fastest guys. So when you're going up against the Englands, the France, Germany, there's going to be pace all over the pitch. And to have, you know, those guys in the back, I appreciate them for what they do for the club. I think for the country, it's a different thing. And, and I would much rather have guys like Bongiorno, Calafiori, having an opportunity back there, especially Calafiori specifically, really. I think that his pace could be a weapon. I know he doesn't really play as a central center back. That's why I was kind of hoping he would have got the call up instead of Mancini when, when uh, Acerbi got sent home, because yeah. it would have been nice to see him maybe try that out. Then you have, you know, maybe Scalvini, Calafiori and Bastoni that first match. You could have seen what you would have had there. Um, I think it would just be better with a back four. My only concern though, is that's where Bastoni's actually exposed the most. So like, if you're going to yeah. play him, that's going to leave you a little vulnerable too uh, defensively. My biggest knock on him is his defensive ability. Going forward, the ball, I'm confident, but it's just, 
it, it, Spalletti is in a tough situation. Like, I, yeah. I don't really think there's a right choice. You know, I'm not going to – if he decides to stay with the 3-4-2-1, I'm okay with it because, I mean, he's – listen, at the end of the day, he's the manager. He sees it. Um, if he goes back to a back four, then what do you do? Do you just – you know, I don't think they're going to want to drop Bastoni to the bench, but I don't know. It's 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 tough. But I he's, think I get – I guess when I put it out there again, now I guess I would agree with Lou then just go back, you know, do a 3-5-2 – at least that way you could have that, you know, more guys like stack in the middle really there. And then all of a sudden you get into a similar problem to what we've experienced all season, Lou, with the Chiesa and getting him in on the pitch and getting him in a spot where he hurts. So it's a tough spot Spalletti's yeah. in. I honestly think that it's going to be a tough call, but, you know, you might have to go with what the guys are comfortable at the back that you're going to have to go to, but I think you're going to have to help that midfield because just having two of them in there is not enough and you're going to have to bite the bullet up front and somebody's going to somebody's going to be a little bit uncomfortable one way or another. And I think when you you look at this side, like DeMarco's still going to be able to get his job done even as a left back. If he's not left wing back, he doesn't have three, he's still going to be a bomber, right? Cambiasso is so versatile. He can do it on other, either side. I think he'll help. Di Lorenzo, uh, he has been on a, he's been a, in a funk for a while now. And I don't know, man, he's not really uh, giving me the uh, confidence that I had before in him. And I don't know what's going on there with him. Using him as a right CB in a back three, I didn't like it. I don't like him as a wing back on the right. So for him, it'd probably be better if he plays right back. But I'd honestly go with somebody that uh, maybe like a Kami, a little bit more energy, you know, against some of those teams we're going to face. But it's uh, it's a tough spot that uh, Spalletti's in. We are going to take a look at... Uh, you know what the projection is as far as the roster going into there. And you could see a couple names that uh, were mentioned uh, being out there as uh, reserves there with Calafiori, Bonaventura. You've got uh, Mancini in there who I don't even really know why we would bother. Zaccagni, Politano, <laughs> Scamacca. So, I mean, at uh, Portieri there, you could see goalkeepers. There's really nothing to discuss. Donnarumma, Vicario, uh, Merit. I mean, you could... I mean, if you're talking about third string, you could maybe say uh, Di Gregorio, you know, but I mean, it's third string. That's what I would do, yeah, but yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, but I mean, uh, based on it, I'd probably say Di Gregorio, but no big deal. When you look at the defensive list, my my lord here, okay, uh, Di Lorenzo, Darmian, Acerbi, Scalvini, Bastoni, Bongiorno, Bellanova, Cambiasso, Di Marco, and uh, Yudogi. Guys, what do you think? Pretty straightforward. I I would just swap Di Lorenzo for Calafiore personally, but other than that, I mean every everything else is yeah pretty straightforward. Di Lorenzo I, and Calafiore. Lou, what are you thinking at the back there? I don't just I don't I don't think I would take uh, Undogi. I think I would either take Calafiore or another attacking player. Udogi not getting in there, eh? Yeah, I'm kind of I was kind of thinking the same. I don't know about you, Doji, there. I, and I, I feel like you're going to want Calafiori in there. Like, I really do. So, you know, the one thing we all have in common is we want Calafiori in there. So, yeah. you know, you got you to gotta make a pick there. When we get to uh, the Centro Campo there, Barella, Giorginio, Cristante, Fratesi, Locatelli, Pellegrini. We got the, uh, I, I tell you right now, uh, the ruling came down that uh, misconduct there from uh, the FA on Tonali. It would have loved to have his name there instead of Cristante. Yeah. Um, Cristante is the only sore spot for me. I would, uh, but I, if we're talking about, you know, the alternatives, I, I guess I get it. But he's the only guy on that list out of the midfield that I'm probably thinking I'd like to see an upgrade. I, Lou? I, I think it's, I would remove Undogi and bring in that uh, Orsolini. He's not on that list. Yeah, we were going to get to uh, up top there. And, uh, you know, real quick there, Gianni midfield, anything? I mean, I, don't, I was trying to think, like, who would I bring in for Cristante if I was going to leave him off? And I can't really think of someone that I'd be totally confident. Obviously, yeah, like you said, Tonali. But, like, yeah. since that's not going to happen... There, it's kind of sad like that we don't have anything like we're just so lacking in depth in the midfield like yes we do have bona fide starters 
<clears throat> and I would I would say between you know Barella, Locatelli, Jorginho, and Pellegrini, any three of those or yeah of those guys would be my starters. But after that, I'm it's it's kind of rough. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. and that's really it. Like I said, I'd like to have Cristante out of there, but I really can't come up with somebody at the moment, and that's kind of a tough thing for Spalletti up top. Lou mentioned the name, and I'd say I agree. He's got to get in there for me. Uh, you got to find a way to get Orsolini in this squad. What, what are we talking about here? He's in better form than Zaniolo. He's in better form than Chiesa. He's in better form than Raz. Like, I, I don't understand it. I, I really don't. Even if you're looking at some of the names behind him, Zaccani, Politano. Like, I, I, I got to have Orsolini in the squad. That's really the one that stands out to me uh, the most. Um is Orsolini. Gianni, Orsolini, Lou, we know he wants Orsolini in there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I do it as trolling, but, I, but I'm, I'm big on Orsolini, not so big on Chiesa. Uh, not that I don't think that Chiesa is probably the, one of the most talented attackers. I just don't think that he really fits. It's not. It, that's the only thing that I have. It's like, where do you play him? Like, if, At least you know if you go to a, a, a 4-3-3, you could have a, a spot for him. But if you're doing this three five two or three four two one, where where do you put him? That that's what makes it tough. I think it's easier for a guy like a guy like Orsolini to to find space and, and be able to make the best of, of his opportunities. Yeah. Obviously, he assisted on the Barella goal with a, with a beautiful pass there. So I mean, I feel like that's got a kind of a lasting memory for you know for Spalletti to kind of want to include him. And another name that's not even included on this that I. Listen, I know he's playing in the championship, but I do think that he's been performing at a at a at a great rate. But you got to think of you know Wilfred Nyonto. I I would actually rather see him in there over Zaniolo, pers- or even Raspadori, one of the two. Like I, I think if you gave me Retegi, Orsolini, Nyonto, and and which and I, you know I would have to say Chiesa then would be the fourth guy. Yeah, I'd actually be more excited about that attack and that potential than what I see right now. It's a decent shell for sure, and I mean like Zaniolo is. Is not in the four. Like we talked about this and we had a good chat about it uh, in our group chat there, Lou. But I said, like, he's got the talent. The form is just not there. But like, he, he's the kind of guy that if he gets hot, it, it could be fantastic. But it just, I, I don't know. It, it, he hasn't really given us or shown us anything in these friendlies, at least, to be like, yeah, he's got to be around. So I, I don't know. There are some question marks there. The Nyonto shout. I uh I don't mind it. I don't mind it. We do have to take a look at uh, the Euros here. This is the group. So Spain, Croatia, Albania will be joining uh, the Azzurri in Group B. And we're going to get the uh, predictions here. Who gets your top two in that group? Is Italy in that top two making it out of that group? And uh, Lou, you're on the spot first. I say we finish third. Third place finish in the group. All right. Gianni, are we making it out of that group? I, I honestly think we're finishing third as well. It's wow. it, it's it I mean it's it's the group of death, man. Like that's that is it's a pretty tough filthy. Group. It's pretty filthy. Gotta <laughs> say. Um if we get out, it's gonna be a grind. An absolute grind, like to to get out of there. Uh I'm gonna remain hopeful and say that they find a way just because Italy in tournaments, you know, okay, qualifying has been, uh, you know, a disaster as of late. But once they get in there, there's something about the Azzurri in these tournaments. I'll say that we do get that uh, second spot um, and we find a way. It's, it ain't going to be pretty. I'll tell you that Listen, right now. Your but... mouth to God's ears, man. I hope you're right. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> so there you I, go. I, just, I just worry about getting, like, demoralized by Spain early and then just not being able to Yeah, being that's, that's what scares me for sure. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, four nil I mean, loss, and then it's like, are they just throwing yeah, it in after that? You know, like, that. we'll see, we'll see what happens. But now we are gonna uh, get our attention over to Syria, okay? And we're gonna kick things through the news, try and go through kind of as quick as possible and get everybody's thoughts. Obviously, we got the Acerbi ruling, he was fully acquitted of uh, the allegations against him, uh, making racist uh, comments towards Juan Jesus there, and we saw the aftermath. Uh, everybody flying around um, with their opinions on this, and it essentially came down to lack of evidence. A Cherby was facing a 10-match ban. Um, we have an Inter supporter here, so we're going to kick things off with Gianni and your thoughts on the acquittal. Yeah, I mean, look, it's 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 not good for the league. 
you know, obviously you don't have a, a clear answer there. Like, I mean, it's kind of like a, he said, he said type thing. You don't know what was said. I listen on my podcast. I said, if it comes out that it was heard and, and somebody had proof of it, you know, not even, not even a 10 game suspension, like just terminate the contract. I feel like yeah. there's got to be like some kind of standpoint from clubs that's like, hey, this will not be tolerated. And I think if you want to like stop it and nib it in the butt right away, that's the kind of response you have to have. So uh, I seeing people say that, oh, you know, a charity is a liar. And, and then, you know, it's like we don't know what was said. We, we weren't there. We weren't on the pitch. Like we can't. Yes, we could we could speculate and stuff and everyone could have their own opinions. But I just it is what it is. I mean, I wish the league would do something a little bit more. I don't know, finite or something to kind of make it clear, like, hey, this is how we're going to handle these kind of proceedings. I don't know, like, I don't, I'm not saying you have to have to mic up the players because you don't want to be hearing everything that's kind of said on the pitch, but you got to find a way to to kind of be able to navigate these types of things and 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 kind of make you know players who who are black you know feel like they are represented and are being you know respected within the league. I think. This kind of just paints a bad picture for for all of them, and even like Marcus Taram came out and said, you know, he yeah. he wants some clear answers too, you know, and that was worried like, great, is this gonna like bleed into the locker room where now like yeah. guys like Taram, Bisek, and and Dumfries are gonna have like you know a beef with Acherbi now, so it's uh it's it's not a good look. It's a shame that this is why the league's always in the news for this kind of stuff, but I mean, it is what it is. I I don't even know what else to say really about yeah. it. Yeah, Lou, your thoughts uh, when he was acquitted? Yeah, I, I mean, that there is, like, obviously, I think the precedent with Syria is that so many of these incidents occur, right? It's hard to believe, like, oh, yeah, like, innocent. But you do have to look and say, hey, like, if the evidence doesn't show it, you know, how much was there? We didn't really hear anything. It's hard from us on the outside to be like, hey, he's guilty or, hey, he's innocent, with knowing as little as we do. My big thing is just the league's overall response to it. I thought Spalletti, to be fair, did a very good job with handling it, kind of said, hey, we're going we're gonna to take your call up away. Let's figure this out. Let's see what happened. You know, like, it was fair, right? The FIGC and Gravina just kind of made a mess of it today. Their response was not very good. When they were asked about it just in general, they just, like, kind of be, acted like it was a non-problem. Even though we have it with fans, with players, like, it, it's been a problem for years. Remember since I've been supporting Serie A. It's These like are the guys that put monkeys on a anti-racism campaign. Yeah. Exactly. Let's, They're not the brightest bulbs, you know. Let's like, remember just, that. Yeah. yeah. Once again, I think it, the story here is less about what was said and more about the FIGC, uh, you know, response to it, which again was pretty poor. Even if they were just like to come out, all you have to do is really make a statement and say, hey, you know, if we find a player guilty of doing this, we're going to ban you for a year. We're going to terminate your contract or you're going to have to reapply to be in the league or you know same with fans hey we will take away your fans for quite a part of the year if you do this um i i just think that you know i can't condemn a cherubi but i it's it's very unfortunate to read about this all the time i think it's the moral of the story it's, it's just that, again yeah. it's another month another story it'll probably happen again in april it'll probably happen again in may because we refuse to nip it in the butt any chance I think until it's, like we get a large suspension, it won't change. It's really, really tough. I mean, you you can think of the instance people were bringing up in uh, Sede say there, but the thing is, is there was evidence, there was witnesses, there was players that said they had heard, and I can't remember the names of the players involved, but that's what it came down to was other players saying, "Yes, I heard it. This is what he said." Uh, that, that, the punishment, the punishment was dealt with. However, so here. Obviously, you can't create this precedence where, you know, a player can claim that. Not saying that they would, but you can't kind of set that precedence either. And that's where I kind of understand it. But at the same time, you're dealing with something that is such a big issue. And they've never really taken any steps forward whatsoever. The most difficult thing with this was the threats of a Cherby's career being affected drastically because Inter was talking about termination and that was coming out. Um, and the fact that they didn't have a bunch of evidence, but at the same time, you've kind of created this thing, even though you've said you haven't done it, you've kind of questioned Juan Jesus' character in the fact with nothing at all coming out of it. And I think like something 
had to have come out of this because you did have a big, big ordeal on the pitch. You had a ref looking to his VAR. You had a ref talking to his assistants. You had players, you had a chair be actually apologize. If he didn't say that, you know, and if it was just regular banter amongst the game, he's not even going to apologize. Like there's something that happened. A two game ban and a big fine, a three game ban and a big fine and say, hey, we didn't have the evidence, but there is zero tolerance toward this. This is not going to be a thing that stains your record at Cherby, but you are going to have to face a suspension, you know, a two game suspension, a three game suspension and a hefty fine because we're not going to stand for this as a league. You have to do something as a league is my belief, but it's hard because, again, there's no evidence. It's just really, really tough. I think, but even putting up like a PR message, like even just being like, "Hey, you know, like we couldn't like prove it. We looked at VAR. Here's what the steps we took. It didn't work. You know, but we're against this and we're actively trying to stop it. Here's here's how. Like anyone who does this, this will happen, right? And and that's just it. If they've done nothing now, he's been acquitted. I need to know what the game plan is to shut it down in the future and kind of goes back to what Gianni was saying. Like, what is it? More mics on the sidelines? Like, what is it? What is going to do it to shut it down? So, I mean, even like how they do in, in the NHL, like, you know, when they do, um, like they go to the player safety, the department of player safety, and they have the, those videos released like, Hey, this is the reason we're giving a three game suspension for this, this, and the, like do that. You could even release audio of the, the conversation with VAR trying to investigate it on the pitch. That way the fans, whomever, can feel, hey, all right, this is the steps they made. This is how far it got. They didn't hear yeah. anything. The, the, you know, the, the fourth, uh, the fourth assistant was asked if he heard anything from the silent, whatever it may be. And they, you know, they do their due diligence and then you can be like, all right, you know what? They tried. And that way, you know, people could be, feel a little bit better about it. Cause you know, fans of, of, of either club, you know, they're, they're all pointing fingers. Oh, this guy said this, this guy said that, whatever. And we're never going to know the answer, but I think it'll it'll give them a little bit more peace of mind if like we see the steps yeah. that we're taking to to kind of address it. Yeah. So, in the end, gets cleared up. Uh, all should be well between uh, you know what be the locker room and everything. Uh, I'm sure it'll just uh, continue on we for hope. Inter Inzaghi. Now his extension coming up, and it said that uh, Inter's going to renew for two years, and that's got to be. That's a no-brainer, eh, Gianni? I mean, like, there, I do want to talk to you about something, though, because I believe it was Nima that put this out after the Champions League elimination. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on it because, for me, it's a no-brainer for them to extend it. It's all good. And he didn't insinuate that they shouldn't. He's been high on the extension. All the Inter fans should be high on the extension uh, based on what he's been doing. But he said that it showed the lack of maturity from Inzaghi that he can only get it done in either Champions League or Serie A this season and can't lock it down in multiple competitions. And I'm thinking something was always off with them in Champions League this season. They didn't, You didn't get the Inter that was running roughshod on Serie A, and there's something there. But your thoughts on Nima's comments about Inzaghi and getting it done in multiple comps and why you think we saw kind of that different side yeah I mean you know uh, me and Nima don't always see eye to eye on a lot of things I do call him Nima Napolista for a reason so um, <laughs> I look at what I, I, Inzaghi did in, in Champions League if you look at when we were going through the group stage that was probably our toughest part of this of the season you know we had we had the derby two derbies we had a, i think we had a match with roma somewhere mixed in between there so it's like if we if we gave it all in in the group stage i definitely think we would have suffered at that part of the season in 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 the league so he had a tough time juggling it you know for all the talk of how great our depth is it's great for the Serie A. it's not great for the champions league you know when you're rotating guys like marco arnautovic and then alexis sanchez up top and then your bench, you know, midfielders are guys like da Davy Klassen. Okay, <laughs> yeah. like who, who's who's still using him? You know, re realistically, yeah. like outside of Salernitana, really, I don't think he makes it into a midfield anywhere in Serie A. Yeah. So, I agree with him to an extent. It felt like he was definitely. I mean, we we all knew since the beginning of the season that the objective was the second star. But given how great we were last year in the Champions League, I think. First of all, Interisti were spoiled. 
you know, that was really a dream scenario, the way that all played out. I don't like to admit it, but we did have an easy route to the final. Like, I mean, Porto was probably our toughest tie. Like, we only beat them 1-0. And, and listen, Conceição is a, a fantastic manager. Yeah. Benfica was a cakewalk, in my opinion. And then Milan, we just steamrolled them. I mean, I, I think when you're going up against a, not only a rival, but like a city rival and you share the stadium with them, you're, you're going to be pretty hyped up and you want to make it to the finals there. This year it was it was a completely different thing, unfortunately. You know, um, Atletico I think obviously had more depth. You look at you know they're able to bring on Memphis Depay, and you're able to bring on um, you know Barrios and that kid uh, I forget his name now, another youngster that they have, and we 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 had to go to Alexis Sanchez. You know, it's yeah. it just wasn't wasn't a good enough. He didn't have the right game plan for that second leg, unfortunately. I, I think that we should we. When we went up 2 nil on the aggregate, he kind of took the foot off the gas and allowed them. Unfortunately, you know, they got a, a lucky goal like a few minutes later where I think if Pavard tries to clear that ball 99 times out of 100, he'll be able to get get it out. But, yeah, yeah it's – I don't really fault him. I think more it's, it's, it's a lack of depth that really did him in. And I think if we had better players coming off the bench, it, even that Atletico's bench, you know, with Correa and, and Depay, yeah, I would have felt better, you know, being able to rotate and stuff. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I, I try to be a little bit more realistic with the expectations. Yes, that I want to go on, of course, but I, I, I knew that it was going to be, be tough, and I, I really thought we had the toughest tie of any team in, in the, in the round of sixteen. Yeah, I think uh, I'd agree to that too. And yeah, I don't see it as, uh, you know, how Nemo was saying the lack of maturity from him. I just think it was, uh, you know, it, you have to get some luck on your side and you need the stars aligning sometimes to make those deep runs. You got a good draw last year and whatnot. And then, you know, you get it in the brain that, okay, now this year, you know, we go back to the final, at least semifinals again. But it's it's tough. It's tough. And the depth, man, you don't got to tell us, man. We saw a final where we had to pull in freaking Lamina off the bench, for Christ's sake. Yeah. So, you know, it, it plays a big part. And it's something that, you know... Uh, yeah, the the finances make a big big difference, and Italian teams are gonna have to find ways to uh, get get it done because yeah, the depth's gonna be something that kind of suffers as these teams try to build while being hindered uh, financially, right? But uh, Lou, uh, your thoughts from the outside looking in on uh, Inzaghi's work at Inter, real quick before we move on. I th I think that like some of the non Inter fans and maybe even some Inter fans, a lot of, like the Juventus fans, kind of fell for how good Inter was in Syria. I think that they would be like a dark horse in Europe. And I think Gianni hit it spot on the head. It's you know if we're being honest, they did get lucky with their side of the bracket last year on their way to the Champions League final, and they did get lucky. I mean, for as good as they were in that final, I don't want to discredit them. Man City was very poor in that final. They looked, you could feel the pressure was on City. Inter was kind of playing with free money a little bit performed really well, arguably should have won that game. And then you come into this year and it's like the expectation was always to rebuild to win the Scudetto maybe when Inzaghi took over. And all of a sudden you're looking at the Champions League. Um, I think it's a little harsh. I, if they would have lost to like a a smaller club, like a, I don't know, maybe not like a Porto, but you know, like somebody that's not like, like Copenhagen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Copenhagen or something like that, yeah. Like someone like that, then I'd be like, yeah, you're right. Like Inzaghi, he kind of shit the bed in Europe, but yeah. they could do better. But Atletico Madrid is a team that if they end up in the final, I wouldn't be surprised. They're they're a little underrated. So, you know, I just yeah. think that it's unlucky. But like what Inzaghi's done in Serie A this year, I mean, how they, they might – they might win it again next year. That's how good this team is. So. Yeah, even talking about their game plan in that, I, you know, I can't really fault Inzaghi too much. Uh, you know, I know that uh, the Inter fans would have liked a little more foot on the throttle, but at the same time, you're walking in there, you got a one-goal lead, you know that forces Atletico to kind of open up at home, and you're taking your chances that you could sting them. And your team has given you enough evidence that they could do that this season. So I kind of I kind of get it. It just wasn't working out, and... They had to come out of their shell a little bit more, and it just, it's just it's a tough one. It was so tight. It was such a tight game. It was great to watch um, yeah. just with not no skin in the game. Watching that, it was actually a good watch. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, Inzaghi's been doing a great job. So the extension, no-brainer. Some quick little hitters here. 
Giroud going to MLS, going to LAFC. Uh, Milan being linked with a bunch of strikers. Xerxes is the one that Mirko Di Natale tips off uh, to be closest to Milan. We'll see what happens there. They're getting rumors about Kefren Taram now. I don't want to, you know, kill your dreams here, Milan fans, but $40 million, that Gazetta is not going to be the price tag, what they're telling you, okay? Uh, we know, as Juventini, it's minimum 60 million euros. It's probably going to go a little bit higher this summer. Don't get your hopes up, okay? Uh, Bremer. Release clause, this was a big one for us today, Lou. Obviously, uh, finding out that it was confirmed. I think the scariest part about this is that the Daily Mail fucking got something right, man. Because they were the first to actually report that, yeah. man, you was looking at Bremer because of this release clause. We're like, what are you guys on? What are you guys on? Like, he doesn't have one. Mirko Di Natale is saying, I've got no confirmations of one. Boom, all of a sudden this morning, Romeo Gresti come out and saying, confirmed. Uh, a variable uh, release clause, but Skira says it is in fact hard 70 million euro release clause that kicks in not this summer, the next one, 2025. 10% uh, uh, sell on clause on anything over 40 million for Torino. And uh, there you have it. Um, I'm going to be just as blunt as I can be, I just don't like it because we took away any leverage we have of selling them. There's no scenario here that I see that uh, makes sense of this release clause to me. Uh, you had a hype train in Hoyland sold last year for 70 million euros. A few years back, we bought Matthias De Ligt for 90 million euros. Um, you have all these pieces of evidence all around you. And right now you have, in my personal opinion, the best center back in Serie A. And you've handcuffed yourself to a fee of 70 million euros. Yes, we will see capital on that. But still, why? It just, it's still another sign to me that we're not strong sellers. And we just haven't been strong sellers. This one makes no sense to me why you would do that. Especially if he has Premier League teams interested. This is the league we are all chasing when it comes to marketability, finances, sponsorship, all this. They have the money. Make them pay. I just don't understand why you make it easier. Um, I don't like it. I, I don't like it. Lou? Yeah, I mean, you basically summed up. I, I don't like it either. I think that from a Juventus perspective, it's just a disaster. You put a price tag on a player that... Okay, if he wants to leave, you know, that's fine. But you just, you literally just gave away all your leverage. I think, though, as a whole, it's kind of a conde uh, condemnation of the league. Like, you know, like we know Milan, Inter, Juventus, the financial situation is bad with all three of those clubs. Inter, or Juventus, very publicly, how terrible it's been, you know, with uh, everything that happened last year. Uh, we, we all need to sell. We really can't turn down expensive offers from other um, clubs. You know, Juventus have a big three, Vlaovic, Giesa, Bremer. Bremer probably the most profitable at the moment. Um, but I am curious to see how this plays out because if Bremer, like, jumps ship this year, right, for, like, 70 million, he joins, like, a Tottenham or a Manchester United who's not in the top four. I think that's a bad look on, on what people value Serie A as, like, a whole. You know, if Bremer jumps to Liverpool, he jumps to City, he jumps to Real Madrid, you're like, okay, he jumped to a bigger club. He's making like a move to Manchester United, which, you know, listen, United's a big name. It's a big brand. But last three, four years, they're not inter this, right? Uh, so if you're making a move like that, or even like a Tottenham or a Newcastle, what does that say about like the top four sides in Serie A, just in terms of what the global impression is of them? And that's something I, I wonder about, you know, even with the price tag or things like that. Like if teams think we've been hearing that Bremer, the United thought he was worth 60 million for a long time. Now, maybe that was the release cause. Maybe it wasn't. But I just sometimes wonder if, like, they look at Serie A and they think, ah, yeah, it's Juventus. It's the best player in Serie A. But it's like, yeah, fourth place, no Europe. What really is it, right? I just get this look that they look down on us. And I'm curious to see where that plays out, you know? It's just it's just really, really weird. For me, the club's got to get their spine about them because – if players are looking at us to do that and take that step and then whatever, move on, whatever, okay, that's fine. We need to protect ourselves and you still need yeah. to get the best out of it. So making a meal, uh, uh, a deal like this that essentially we'll see somewhere around 40 million euros capital. Okay, yeah, that's big. That's big capital gain. That's great. But in the grand scheme of things, 
in today's market, it's Nothing. one player. That's yeah. one player. And it's probably not going to be a player that replaces Bremer in terms of importance to Juventus. And that's why it feels like old business resurfacing for us, where we gave up key guys and we never actually replaced them with equal or better guys. And we've been doing that for quite some time and in the midfield especially. And it's been this kind of sore spot is the selling at Juventus. This for me is finally a moment where you get a big guy. That's not just like a big guy in terms of what he's doing for us. He's a big guy. He's actually backing it on the field. This isn't a guy that his value is suffering. It's not like he's not playing well. He is balling out at his role and you still handcuffed yourself it it hurts me man it hurts me i got into one one thing i just want to say i go one uh into this with some fans today on, on twitter which is everyone gets mad when you say like hey these these players look at our clubs as stepping stones right and sometimes i think recruitment and i think what inter has done really well under Morata is their recruitment right take someone like pavar they recruit him and you hear the way he talks about inter and the experience of the fans like it's almost like the way Kadir talked about us when he signed, like, you know, like it's love, it's passion for the club, it's pride. Right. You know, like, I just think sometimes like Juventus, they did this with the lit they had doing it with Bremer where it's like two, three years, they're looking to jump ship, you know, like it's got like they use this for a stepping stone for a bigger club. I just think that in terms of recruitment, all three of these clubs, Inter probably do it the best, but Milan and Juventus could do a little bit better at finding guys that, actually want to play in the league, really like take Serie A seriously, take Juventus seriously, want to buy into a project and build to it and not use it as a stepping stone. Um, and I think Serie A as a whole needs to look at that. It, it, well, that ties into Serie A just enhancing their product overall. And yeah. that's, a, that's a major concern for all of us fans, I feel. But from the outside looking in on this deal, uh, Gianni, obviously no skin in the game as you're an Inter supporter. What do you think of this release clause news that came out? As uh, obviously you knew we were tied to to Bremer ourselves. You know he was somebody that I really wanted um, to be the centerpiece of our back three as well. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of crazy to kind of include that in his contract, especially at that low of a price. You know when you look at Inter, we Marcus Taram has a release clause. It's 95 million. You know like. Yeah. Would you say Marcus Thuram is more valuable than Bremer? Probably not, you know, and yeah. and the fact that we signed him on a free and then we were smart enough to put that in. Like, if anybody wants to come and get him this summer, I mean, yeah, I'll take 95 million. I love Thuram. I don't want to sell him, but for yeah. 95, yeah, I guess I, I won't complain. That's the um, point of it. If you're going to put one in, you got to protect <clears throat> yourself. You just got to protect yourself, Yeah, you know? like And, 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 and kind of how Lou was bad. saying with our recruitment, you know, and, and, and being able to keep people here. One thing that I do love is when people leave Inter, most of them want to come back. They didn't want to leave in the first place. You know, Onana still talks about us. Hakimi, same thing. Um, Lukaku, we saw what he did, all the work he did to get back. I mean, it felt good at the time. I wasn't happy with the results when we did get him back. But, yeah. you know, that that's the kind of environment I want. I only want players that also want to stay at my club and want, you know, to to con- continue it and, and help it grow and, and, and achieve greatness there. And if people are looking at Juve, Inter, or Milan as stepping stones, I that yeah, that is an indictment on the league. You know, like yeah. we shouldn't be looked at that. Uh, these are three of the biggest clubs, not just in Italy, but in all of Europe. I mean, you look at the success that we've all had in 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 all the tournaments. Really, it's it shouldn't be looked at that. And to see like clubs like Newcastle, Tottenham, and, and Manchester United able to to pick yes, man, like Manchester United was a big brand, but they I would put our clubs right now any one of them up against Manchester United. And I feel like we'd win comfortably, whether it's Juve, Milan, Inter, anyway, I'll even take Bologna over, over Man U, to be quite honest, you know? So if, if that's what Bremer or really anyone in Serie A wants to do is to go make that move. I think you're just looking at it as the dollars and cents, not so much as, as what you can achieve, you know, on the pitch and in terms of glory and trophies and stuff. So we need as a league to figure out a way to, one, keep our talent here, but also make it profitable so that everyone, whether it's the teams, the fans, the the players themselves, can 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 want to stay and enjoy the time there because it's this league is to, is still better than than the EPL in my opinion. So. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, there you go. You guys uh, agree with uh, everything said there. And, uh, man, it, it, a little bit of a red flag, I think, for Juntoli. Uh, this one, a little bit of cause for concern. And yeah. I think that's fair. I think that's fair, to be honest, because a lot of you and Tini were focusing their attention there and saying, man, this is uh, not shining a good light on him. So we'll see what comes down. Guys, before we get to round, tw- uh, round 30, excuse me, Totti, Francesco Totti, 31 years to the day since his debut in Serie A. The man that said he cheats on his girlfriends, but he'll never cheat on Roma. All right. Now we got to talk about Francesco Totti. Um, just your opinions of him, where you rank him kind of amongst players in your mind. And uh, let's kick things off with uh, Lou. Your thoughts on uh, Totti? Oh man, Totti, he's one of my favorite uh, non Juve players ever. He's just class, pure class. Uh, he could win a game on on his own. He could do it all. The, the flicks, the, the goals, the passes. I mean, you remember the year that he retired from the Azuri in like 2006? People thought like was, he was like, look at the end of his career and he was like top scorer in Serie A. Like, tremendous player. The fact he did it, I mean, I know staying at Roma for all those years took a little hindrance in him, but just you got to respect something like that. And, I always get flagged for this. I did get to see prime ADP, but I thought Tati is peak. There just wasn't a better player. He just there was something about him at his peak. He just it felt like he could do everything. He was kind of gritty. He, he got in fights. He got red cards. He had a little bit of a temper. The long hair, the celebrations, it just magical player. Yeah, Tolti was uh, incredible. I still take ADP, but Tolti was nuts. Gianni, your thoughts on Tolti? Yeah, I mean, I've always said that he's the one guy uh, for the national team that I wish would have played for Inter at some point. He was my favorite Italian player, um, probably after Baggio for me. Like, I, I, I loved Roberto Baggio, but, um, I mean, the goals that he scored, I, I mean, <laughs> I saw one, you know, the chip that he made outside the the 18 over uh, over Julio Cesar, which oh, was yeah. unbelievable. Like, I one think that's to have... my favorite Totti goal, actually, like, ever. Ever. It's either that or the volley from like the side of the 18 that he did left footed. Yeah. I mean, I don't know which end, one I like. At the end of his career, when he was like in his late thirties, right? Rumble would bring him on for five minutes of the game when they were down a goal and like literally win the game on like taunty, like random goals. Like there's a game against Torino where he touched the ball twice and had two goals, like at 39, just there's something, the, there's something magical about that guy. There just is, the, you these, know, these guys like, we were spoiled as Azzurri fans. Like you had a generation that I don't know how these guys came away with nothing. When you have Maldini, Nesta, Cannavaro, uh, Totti, Del Piero. We got robbed in 2002. I mean, yeah, we did. That, that, was ro- that was robbery for sure. That was... But it, it's just, it's wild. But like the stories, you know, Totti uh, joking about chipping, uh, you know, a keeper or whatever and walking up there and be like, uh, they're like, yeah, go ahead, do it now. He's like, okay, no problem. In the most intense scenario, you know, uh, away from home, Holland, uh, I think it was Van der Sar in net, this monster in there. Oh, yeah, Panenka, no problem. Uh, just guys like that, fearless, like, and the quality and the class, like, we used to produce them like nothing, man. And uh, it's just, uh, we were we were spoiled through that era, but Totti is a big, big guy. Uh, Big, big guy that was a part of that. So, uh, obviously, it was awesome seeing him part of the uh, 06 squad and then hoist that uh, World Cup trophy. Always have that uh, memory. The PK against Australia and the the famous uh, thumb suck and Selly there from uh, Totti. It was a good ride. It was a good ride. Nice to see some of those guys out of that generation get something. So, uh, yeah, Totti, man, absolute beauty. And, yes, we talked about that goal. Uh, the, uh, yeah, You know the reason it's – one of my favorites because it was against you guys. You know that, Gianni. You know, you know. I mean, listen, I, I, it's one of my favorite goals, and it happened against my guys. So, you know, <laughs> imagine how I feel. There like. you go. And to have That's the cool. ball do that in a game, like, holy yeah. cow, like, what are you doing? Like, <sighs> it, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. I'm going to pull up the standings. You guys, we're going to recap round 29, what went down real quick, and then get to preview and predictions. Okay. So, in round 29, which was a couple weeks back because of those uh, international breaks there, Bologna 1-0 over Empoli. Torino 
2-0 over Udinese. Monza, 1-0 over Cagliari. Lecce, 1-0 over Salernitana. Lazio, 3-2 over Frosinone. The Juve Genoa, 0-0. And Vlaovic taking a red card. Madonna. Milan, 3-1 over Verona. They continue... Uh, a great run since like December. Uh, Milan's just on fire, especially away from home. We'll get to that in a bit. Roma finds a way a little bit tighter than I would have expected against Sassuolo, 1-0, but De Rossi's crew keeps getting the job done. Atalanta Fiorentina ends up getting postponed. Uh, time to be determined. And then Inter Napoli with the 1-1 one, one draw. All right. So that kind of sets uh, up our uh, previews for what we're about to see in round 30. We're going to kick things off with Napoli and Atalanta. So Napoli unbeaten in their last six. That's two wins, four draws. Atalanta starting to sputter a bit. One win, two losses, two draws, last five. Uh, Coop Mainers and Di Catalare, they're monitoring on a day-to-day basis. It's uncertain who is actually going to make this game for them. But Cabratskelia is listed to be out as of right now for this game for Napoli as well. So you got some key guys potentially missing on both sides. What is your pick going into this game? We're going to kick this one off with Lou. Prediction. I think I think Atalanta edges Napoli out of this. Without uh, Cabratskelia... I don't think they have enough to, to beat him in that. And uh, I think that's pretty crucial if they want to finish in that sixth spot. So, mm. Okay. Okay. Gianni. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree with everything Lou said there. Pretty much uh, would just be echoing it. So, Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. I, I'm going to actually say draw. Draw. Flat out draw yeah. on this one. A little soft on the road from Atalanta. Key guy missing for Napoli. Napoli, every time I bank on them, it just goes wrong. But same with Atalanta. It's weird. It's just weird. So I'm just going to say draw. Okay? I'm going to avoid it at all costs. Genoa, Frozenone. Genoa with one point in the last three games. Uh, winless in four. Only one time this season with uh, Giardino. Okay? And it actually started with a loss to Frozenone. However, Frozenone is the second worst team on the road in all top five leagues in Europe. Okay? Um, only Granada is worse. Okay. Four losses, one draw in their last five overall. I'm taking Genoa with the win in this game. Um, Gianni, what do you got? Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that attack that Genoa has with Retegui and Goodmanson, I, I don't think Frosinone is going to be able to compete with that. And so, yeah, I, I'll probably say, honestly, like a, I'll say a three nil win for them. Three nil win, comfortable win there. Lou? I also think Genoa will uh, come away with the win. They'll win comfortably. I also think that Frosinone may find themselves getting relegated. They're starting to skid a little bit. I'm a little nervous oh, for Oh, man. They've been in a brutal, brutal run for a long time. Goodmanson going to be the guy to watch here. And uh, Gianni getting some good news there. It appears that he wants to join Inter. That's a good pickup. He's on 10 goals and 3 assists going into this one. And then we got our own property in there, Lou, playing in this one. Sule on 10 goals and 2 assists. And, yeah. hey, who knows what's going to happen with uh, Sule. We will see. I heard Torino. He to too. What's that? <laughs> Coming to Inter too. Oh, is that the next news update uh, coming on uh, Twitter or X tomorrow? That's the next one. We'll resign the AJC if that comes in tomorrow. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Torino and Monza, right? So nine home clean sheets this season for Torino. Um, They're tied with Inter and Bologna. And one more will tie their record that they've done on eight occasions of reaching 10 clean sheets at home. The last time they've done it is the 1994-95 season, all right? And as far as uh, Monza goes, four wins and one loss in their last five. So this one, I think, is going to be actually a really, really good game. I think it's going to be a tight one. I think Torino's going to just edge out uh, Monza. I'm going to give the home team the victory here. Uh, Lou, who are you taking in this one? I'm going to disagree. I think Monza's going to just beat them slightly. Close game. I think we're in for a really good one, but I think Monza's form coming in, it'll be tough to beat. There you go. So we're split. Gianni? I'm going to have to side with Lou on this one too. Yeah, I think Monza's going to be able to, to edge him out. There you go. There you go. Lazio, Juventus. 
Oh, are you ready for this one, Lou? My word. Okay. Uh, not a lot of points in the last uh, eight games for Juve. Seven. We are reeling. Okay. You look at Lazio on the other side. Three straight losses at home, but in comes Tudor. And this is very, very uh, important to focus on because Tudor is going to change the setup to what he plays. That just happens to be the setup that gives Juventus nightmares and we yeah. it forces us to not be able to go to the flanks and we haven't been able to get the job done through the middle of the pitch juve will be without um blauvich's suspension milik and alcarez injured sekulov is coming up from next gen um the <laughs> lazio is going to be fired up under two door this is uh, an interesting one going into Lou. Uh, how do you feel? How do you feel about uh, this one and who are you taking? This game has a lot to a victory written all over it. Uh, Juventus do not play well at the Olimpico, especially against Lazio. Even when we were good with Allegri, we didn't play well at the Olimpico. Never been. Even when we win there, it's always a grind. So, Novlavich, Chiesa, who's kind of gone absent in 2024, Keane, who hasn't scored a goal all season. Uh, the three five two, the two door effect. The stars just say we're gonna lose this one, and when it rains, it pours at Juventus. So Ooh. that's right. Lazio win, Gianni. Look, as much as I want to say Lazio win, uh, I think it's gonna be a one one draw. To be honest, they, I think Lazio gets that new coach bump, but you guys just find the way with like these ratty goals. I, I it drives me insane. I just see a ball like ping ponging around the the eighteen and somehow ending up in the back of the net for you. So yeah, just like one, they one. draw it up on the training pitch, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> I actually I have draw as well. I think this one's got draw written all over it. Um and that's still gonna be a loss for Juventus in the current state. So um, at this point I'm Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's gonna be uh it's gonna be a rough one. I, I don't I'm just not feeling it. I don't know. Uh, the two-door thing, the setup. Uh, yeah. I'd like to say confidently, no, we'll turn it around. We'll snap out of it. But uh, I need them to uh, show me they're ready to do that and take that step. Uh, so I'm going to go with a draw. Fiorentina, Milan in another uh, marquee matchup going into this weekend. Milan's on fire in the ro- on the road in 2024 away okay most points 15 uh most goals with 15 in six games um they've got 14 goals from substitutes this season and it's just insane so like they're like everybody's contributing and that's been a big part of why they've been on such a crazy run for themselves dating back to uh december there uh, really turned it around fiorentina one win in their last five but They are tight games. Fiorentina does perform better at home this season than they do away from home. I think it's going to be tight. I do have one team coming away with a victory, but I want to see where you guys are at in this one. So Gianni, who are you taking in Fiorentina Milan? Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be Milan. Um, Fiorentina, although they, they do play better at home, Whenever they're on the attack, though, they just leave themselves so vulnerable on the back end. And Italiano likes playing this, like, suicide ball. It's, it, it's crazy to me. Like, I, I don't know how people can get behind his coaching style because I would be genuinely horrified if he was coaching at Inter. Like, I, I would have no idea what he's going to do. And I think with the way Milan are playing, they're going to they're gonna get a win themselves. You know, they're going to keep this this run going and uh, keep try to keep the pressure on, on Inter. And, you know, even though we have a, a, a nice cushion – that can change in a matter of games. And then we do have the Derby coming up. So I'm sure they're going to be amped up heading into that. Yeah. Yeah. Lou, who's your pick? I have Milan in this game as well. I, I think that I think, I think they'll probably pull like a two nil or three, one victory. I think they'll win this one comfortably. Uh, just, I agree with everything Gianni said. I just want to just point out like Milan, they kind of got the bump that Inter got last year. Like the second half of the season, they figured it all out. They're getting contributions from everyone. And I think as an American, Christian Pulisic, probably the most underrated player in Serie A this year. Very quietly, like, been one of the better player, better signings from last summer. Um, scores, like, almost every game. So hats off to him. 
I wanted uh, Pulisic. Uh, I was laughed at, and we got uh, Timothy Wea, who I call a city worker. Uh, makes everything <laughs> look uh, extremely uh, strenuous and does nothing. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. I do have uh, Milan winning this one as well. Fiorentina, you could see in the goal differential there. I mean, they're just not scoring goals this year. And Milan, yeah, they've, they've got it going. they got it going when it comes to goals. 15 goals last six game or six game on, on the road there. I don't think Fiorentina is going to be able to uh, match the firepower. So I'm taking uh, Milan in that one. Bologna and Salernitana. Well, Bologna coming off the loss. And that was to uh, Inter there. Um, big win there for your guys, Gianni. But uh, Bologna has not lost two in a row at home under Diago Mota. And if you're ever going to uh, handpick an opponent to not lose consecutively at home, you would want to face this Salernitana side, as everybody can see, on 14 points. Clear front runner for relegation. Um, I don't see Candreva saving them in this one. Bologna for the win, and I think it's going to be comfortable. Um, Lou? Yeah, same here. Bologna, easy win, and uh, there'll be two points off of Juventus for the top four. Oh, yeah, yeah. When we start looking at that, okay, that could be a two point swing there. And yeah, it gets tight. Gianni, Bologna for the win. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Candyman, like you said, won't be able to save Salernitana. I think Bologna is going to win that easily. I wouldn't be surprised if they drop a fiver on them. Oh, there you go. There you go. Plug your uh, Bologna guys in for uh, Fantacalcio. Cagliari Verona. This one's uh, going to be a tight one, I think. Uh, I don't know here. Cagliari, after four matches in a row without defeat, uh, two wins, two draws, suffered a loss to uh, Monza. Verona coming off a win versus Lecce. Um it's just tight across the board when you look at these two teams in every category. Home records, away records, goals scored. Um, but the only thing is, Galleri allows way more goals than Verona. Um, and I actually am taking Verona to just edge them in this one. So I'm going to go with Verona. And this one's got some serious implications when you're looking at the table there and where these two teams sit. Uh, level on points there in 15th and 16th spot and just barely hanging on by two points out of the relegation zone. I'm taking Verona to win this one, though. Uh, Gianni, who do you got in this one? I'm actually going to go with Cagliari. I think, uh, you know, our guy Ranieri is going to be able to, to get his guys to still still play at, at, you know, top level, knowing what's at stake here. And, you know, maybe a little dilly ding, dilly dong for him. And then they get uh, three points. There you go. There you go. We're split on this one. Lou? This is tough because both these teams, uh, Verona always have that late season magic to avoid relegation, those those jerks. And uh, Calgary, <laughs> Brunieri, you know, we know how magic he is. Uh, but I think I'm going to agree with you, Berto. I'm going to slightly edge Verona because I think if they get one, they're hard to break down. So I think if they could like, get an early goal, it'd be tough to beat. All right. All right. There you go. A little bit of a split there. And then you get to Sassuolo and Udinese. Oh, my God. Uh, train wreck uh, pick here. Uh, both sides with only one win in their last five. Sassuolo, 18 losses in 29 matches. Uh, we know Berardi went down for them. You could see where they are in the standings. Uh, 19th there on 23 points. I've got Udinese getting a rare victory for them too, but uh, I'm taking Udinese in this one, Lou. Uh, I really want Udinese to win because I think I speak for both of our teams here and not wanting to see so swallow in Syria ever again because they beat both <laughs> regularly. Um, but I think I'm, if I was going to bet on I think I'd go with a draw. Both these teams are dismal. <laughs> Gianni, who are you going with? Yeah, no, same thing. I... I don't think there's a club that I want to see punted down to Serie B more than Sassuolo. So, yeah, I'm going to hope uh, Udinese gets it done. And I'm, I'm actually thinking of putting a little little wager on Lorenzo Luca to get a goal there. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it. There you go. There you go. Lecce and Roma. Lecce with a hot start to the season. You knew it wasn't going to last. And, uh, yeah, it uh, hasn't. But they've got uh, – they're sitting right at the top of the cusp there in this battle for relegation. As you see on 13 uh, in the table on 28 points. Not safe by any means. Uh, Roma, man, since the Rossi's come in, 22 points. Uh, second to only Inter. 
25 during that span of games. Uh, but Roma's got the most goals in that run and the highest conversion rate all of a sudden at 25%. That's insane um, conversion rate since he's come along. Leche, like we said, one win in their last five, uh, barely uh, surviving there. And I don't see them getting anything out of this one, man. I think uh, Roma taking the victory. You guys agree? Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, yes. If there's a football god, Leche would win and uh, <laughs> wouldn't ruin Pasquale because when you went to screw up against Lazio, Roma are going to be knocking on the door. But, oh, my God. Uh, yeah. yeah. These predictions just get better and better for us, don't they, Lou? Jesus. Yeah, just, I keep looking at the table. I keep looking at these games. And I'm like... We're setting up for pain, man. We're setting ourselves up for pain. We'll see what happens. So we all agree, Roma, there. And then the last one, Inter and Empoli. I mean, come on. You're looking at uh, Empoli there again, just barely surviving, but one point here. Um, oof. Inter's, like, uh, record-breaking at this point uh, if they keep uh, things going the way it's going. Empoli, they've been fighting under Nicola, they've been better, but there's not enough there. I mean, they're they they've got three straight losses. They were all one nil, so they do keep games tight, but there's not enough there. I think to get anything out of this game, I'm going with Inter in this one. So uh, Gianni, I would expect taking the same pick. And Lou, upset of the week, Empoli. God, I win. but I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that one. It's gonna be. <laughs> Yeah, there's not going to be any belief in that. That wraps that up, and then we'll just give you the uh, we'll give you the goal scoring leaders here. Lotaro obviously way ahead there on 23. Vlaovic got himself uh, yeah suspended, so he won't be able to add to that on the weekend. Dybala dealing with a little bit of an injury there. 12 goals. Giroud 12 goals. Osimhen 11. Kavratskele who is most likely going to miss the match this weekend on 10. Sule, Taram, Goodmanson, Coop Mainers. I think Zapata's in there on 10. Lukaku's on 10. You got a ton of guys on 10 goals. That kind of wraps up uh, your goal leaders, and that wraps up the previews and predictions. But uh, you guys, got some marquee matchups. It could get ugly for us being Juve fans, but uh, there are some matchups in there that can affect the table uh, drastically. There's still a lot of football left. This is round 30, and Bologna and Roma are pressing. As far as the Italian coefficients go, it doesn't look as good as it did earlier on in the season for adding a spot to Champions League. We'll have to wait and see what develops there. But, uh, you guys, thank you for your time. It's been great tackling all the news, tackling the Azzurri talk, previews and predictions. Uh, Gianni, I thank you for joining the first time. Hopefully we can get you back on at some point. But I'll let you plug uh, kind of what you got going on because you got the interviews pod and everything. And uh, I'll give you uh, the mic for a bit here just to tell us what you got going on. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I got the interviews pod uh, with my co-host Alessandro. Uh, we just obviously cover everything Inter. Um been doing it now we're coming up on episode i think 77 so pretty pretty proud of that and hoping to to keep it going long past 100 and then yeah if anyone wants to follow me and and see uh me make up stories that people tend to uh believe uh you can follow me at uh at sauce gmp on on uh twitter there you go man there you go and thanks again for joining absolute uh pleasure and uh yeah i'm sure i'll see you out there on x uh, with some more banter and everything and then lou <laughs> Man, just, uh, yeah, try to survive with uh, running the UV News for uh, the AJC team there. Appreciate all you do. And uh, days like today, I feel for you, man. I really, really do. The AJC fans know that the only silver lining every morning is that after I post the news at 5 a.m., Berto has to read it three hours later at 5 a.m. in his time zone. <laughs> oh, yeah. I picture that's when you're uh, kicking back at your desk or whatever and being like, oh, yeah, he's getting up right about now. That bastard can suffer. First, that first retweet notification, I'm like, <laughs> oh, he's in for it this morning. Like, <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> yeah today was a rough one but uh we'll see what happens this weekend uh juve's gotta get it on track my word my word and i do want to ask you one thing before we let off Gianni, because like you know you guys have a healthy healthy lead in syria and whatnot but you you fell out of uh copitalia bounced in champions so what kind of is the rest of this season really all about is it 
guy or there are some guys on the roster fighting for jobs type of thing. What do you take for the rest of the way other than, you know, getting stoked on uh, the Sally at the end of the season? Yeah, for me, it's, you know, I want to be able to to at least come close. Well, we'd have to win out the rest of the, the season, which I think will be tough. But I would like to challenge for the, the Conte record for points. Um, I think we could – you guys had, what, 103 that year? 102, that I think. I think I thought 102? Yeah. 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 102 right, or 103, yeah, something like that. If it's 102, if we win out, we could hit 103. If it is 103, at best we can tie. I would like to try to at least tie it. Um, and then I think we need, if I'm not mistaken, four more clean sheets to have the record for most clean sheets in a season. So, I mean, I, I would like to just, you know, try to try to break some records. That's that's really it. Um, yeah. In terms of players who are fighting for their, their roster spot, I think it's more so proving that certain guys shouldn't really be a part of this team next season. Um, you know, uh, listen, I was I was hopeful for, for Arnautovic just because he was on the treble team, even though he didn't really play a key part. But I was hoping he can kind of come good. Um, he's just not up to snuff. And and anyone who listens to me and knows me, I can't stand Alexis Sanchez. And the fact that he's still a member of this club is just infuriating in so many ways. So, yeah, the sooner we can just get the season over with and get rid of that dead weight, <laughs> the better, in my know. opinion. But. But that's really it. You know, I, I, I want them to to stay motivated. Yes, they have a, a comfortable lead, but like there's still objectives and there's still things to kind of play for. So like why not go for it, guys? You know? I forgot about those records and yeah, you know. Empoli's gonna win this weekend. Because we can't have uh, our record game broken. <laughs> there it. you go. That's Let's it. change the picks. I'm back. No, I still have no belief in that. Thanks, I you guys. What one question before Gianni. Uh what would you say are like like for next year, what's Inter's like? What do they need to prove on? Like, is it depth? Like, is there a position that they need more than anything else going into next year? For me, it's a at least in the starting eleven. You need you need another center center back. I think you know at Cherby's time, he's going to be almost thirty seven. You can't keep relying on him. Stefan Devry, although he's good in certain aspects, you know you saw in the match with Atletico. Kind of how he got turned by Olivier Giroud that cost us the Scudetto two years ago. He got turned by Depay and, and gave up the, the goal that essentially got them to penalties. You, you need to, to get a, a bona fide starter, whether that's a Bongiorno or Calafiori. Uh, I, I want one of them. Like, I don't care who we get. I would like to get one of them for the starting 11. Um, we already know we're getting Zielinski to kind of fill in for Mkhitaryan and Taremi for, for some depth up front. Um, but yeah, I think if we can get one starter and then kind of fill some holes on the bench, uh, that that that's really it. And I would like to go at least a semifinal in the Champions League next year if we're able to to fill that. I think that's it. And then obviously, you know, competing for the Scudetto once again, you you have to, uh, especially after the year we had, there's there's really no excuse to to start a cycle of at least you know two maybe three straight. I think that that's gotta have gonna have to be the expectation. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Guys, been an absolute blast. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in again. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, share the content, uh, follow these guys on X there, follow Sauce GMP, and follow and subscribe at Interviews Pod. All right. And uh, we'll catch you next time for round 31. All right. Ciao, tutti. Take care and enjoy your weekend of calcio.